questions, but if you happen during the presentation at all, you can go ahead and shoot that in the chat box. So to start, um, we're gonna talk about the five functions of your pelvic floor muscles. Um, so first is support. Um, we have organs that rest in our abdomen as well as our pelvis uh, and gravity pulls these, uh, these organs down um, as well as any increased downward pressure. And our pelvic floor muscles are there to provide that support so that nothing comes out of the pelvis. So as you can see here, I've got my handy model and inside we do have some organs through here and your pelvic floor muscles attach across the bottom of the pelvis. So front and back. And as you can see from there, they, they're almost like a hammock that allows for like a sling to, to, for those organs to rest from. The next function is stability. So through there, uh, your pelvic floor muscles are a part of your core muscle group. So they have to work in conjunction with your diaphragm uh, to provide an automatic core response, which is what we're constantly looking for um, as we're working out as we're trying to lift uh, all sorts of functional activities that we're doing throughout the, throughout the day. And that's something that we'll talk about later on as we keep going through the slideshow. Um, it's another reason why we emphasize posture so much in terms of that relationship between diaphragm sitting on top of rib cage and then pelvic floor underneath. Um, sphincter is our next function that we have. So that as whenever we increase uh, intra abdominal pressure, whether through activities like coughing, sneezing, laughing, jumping, uh, our pelvic floor muscles have to be able to contract around your urethra and your anus to prevent any leakage. On the flip side of that, they also need to be able to relax um, so that we can comfortably void or urinate as well as have comfortable bowel movements. For sexual performance, these muscles are also super important because they help with uh, maintaining and sustaining an erection as well as achieving orgasm. Individuals who have some sort of uh, or who experience pain during intercourse oftentimes have some sort of uh, pelvic floor dysfunction. And then the last function uh, is the sump pump function that we call it. Your pelvic floor muscles have to be able to contract and relax to uh, move along fluid or any lymph that goes through the system. Um, to decrease any swelling or congestion in the pelvic region. All right. So Kat was talking about the stability aspect of the pelvic floor function and how posture relates to that. So what I'd like to do is just explain a little bit more the, how the alignment of the diaphragm and the pelvic floor work together and then find that alignment on yourself. So if you're sitting or you're standing, you can go through that. If you've been in some of our other classes on posture, this will be a little bit of a review, but a good analogy for how the core functions is using a soda can. So we got a little spin drift can. I called this the Coke can analogy during one of our last lectures, but someone left a comment saying I shouldn't say Coke because what if they like Pepsi or something? So sorry, spin drift, it's better. But if we look at a, a soda can here, it is strong because of its ability to withstand pressure. If the top was closed, you could not crush this. If a car or a truck ran over it, it likely would not crush it. It would just push it out to the side. That is because of the pressure within the enclosed can. That's like having a very strong diaphragm, which would be the top of the can, pelvic floor, which is the bottom of the can and all of the support muscles around, which we can talk about transversus abdominis, your obliques, your multifidi, all of the core muscles functioning together. So if you have a strong system with a good top, bottom, and cylinder, you'll be able to create lots of intra-abdominal pressure. You'll have a strong core. You'll have good energy transfer. Now, why is posture important in all this? If you put a little dent in the Coke can, okay, or in the spin drift can, let's just do that. All right, now, instead of someone sitting, and I might help, have you help me angle that if needy. Instead of me sitting in a way where my thoracic 
cage, my rib cage is on top of my pelvis in a vertical fashion. Doing something like this to the can is like me maybe holding myself upright. So you can see how I've got a little hinge here and there's a little hinge in this can. Now it's very easy to crush that can when the force of gravity is uh, pressed down upon it because the elements are not stacked vertically in a way that would efficiently transfer force. All right. So as we stand and as we posture ourselves, as we sit really in any and all postures, the goal is to have a vertical rib cage over a vertical pelvis. And what I want you to do is go through this with me in a brief exercise, and then we'll draw into how that affects diaphragmatic function as well as pelvic floor function. So again, you may be um, standing, but hopefully you have a chair nearby because you'll feel this best in sitting. What I'd like you to do is slouch down. It is the way that a lot of us might sit, whether reclined or if we're not using a chair, even if we're using a chair back potentially, we, we tend to fall into this round position. The back of our pelvis is round, so if we're sitting on the back of our pelvis and not on our pelvic floor, we tend to roll off of that contour of the bone. What I'd like you to do is try to take a deep breath in right now. And exhale. Okay. Notice if you're able to expand your abdomen when you're slouched and somewhat compressed in the front like this. And notice if you feel any downward pressure into the chair through your pelvic muscles. You'd be surprised if you're able to achieve much function in that way, in this posture. Now, on the contrary, if you sit up really tall, and I want you to sit up to a point that you kind of feel like you're gripping from your back a little bit to hold that elevated posture. Now take a deep breath in again, and then exhale. Again, how well can you breathe into your abdomen in this position? In this position, things are overly lengthened. It'll likely feel as you take a deep breath in, like there's resistance there and that you must breathe into your shoulders and into your neck in order to pull the air in with your ribs instead of allowing a optimal diaphragmatic breath, which involves the diaphragm descending and more of a relaxed position where the abdominal can naturally ex ex uh, expand. So go ahead and slouch again and then sit up tall and come to a comfortable middle position where you feel like you're not gripping from your back and you feel like you're not slouching off the back of your pelvis. Now your surface may be soft and if it is, this will be a little harder to feel, but you might be able to tell that you're sitting on two round bones. I want you to shift your weight slightly forward to the front edge of those bones. And as you shift your weight slightly forward, you're gonna feel the fleshy part of the pelvis, not the bones, that's your pelvic floor. That's the canopy of muscle that Kat was talking about. So now you've aligned yourself in more of a vertical position. You're like that soda can before it was crushed and you're sitting forward over the pelvic floor. Now in this not too tall, not too slouched position, put one hand on your stomach and take a deep breath in trying to fill that hand on your stomach. And then exhale. It should feel like you have a better ability to expand that abdomen. Go ahead and sit up really tall again, try to breathe into your abdomen. You should feel like you can't really get full expansion and then slouch down again, try to breathe into your abdomen. Again, can't really get full expansion. You're forced to breathe elsewhere. So now come back to where you're not too slouched, not too tall, neutral, right over the pelvic floor. And I want you to close your eyes while you do this and feel as you inhale that your pelvic floor can get a little bit heavier into the surface that you're sitting on. So take just two or three deep breaths in. And I'll, keep, I'll start talking, but you keep trying it a few times. You should feel that as you inhale, that diaphragm descends, which pushes the stomach out, which allows the pelvic floor to descend into the surface. And essentially that canister is moving up and down together. That Coke can, that spindrift can is moving together. As the diaphragm descends, the pelvic floor descends. As the diaphragm elevates, the pelvic floor elevates. All right, that's only gonna happen optimally if you're postured optimally. With again, a vertical rib cage over a vertical pelvis and a little bit of a forward weight shift in sitting. So you're actually loading those muscles of your pelvic floor. All right, it's all about that ability to engage those muscles optimally to maximize core function and intra-abdominal pressure. Okay, so just some questions to think about. You don't need to answer these out loud, but um, these are just things to, to kind of provoke you to, to be thinking about certain things and whatnot um, as we're going through this lecture. Um, so 
do you or do you know of anyone who experiences any leakage of urine or stool? This could be with activities like what we said before, coughing, sneezing, exercising. Um, during intercourse, do you experience any pain? Is it difficult or painful to orgasm or to maintain an erection? Uh, do you have any discomfort or pain in your pelvis at all? And is that maybe associated around menstrual cycles or with certain positions um, of working out or whatnot? Um, and then do you have any back pain or hip pain? Um, that could be associated with or without any awareness of pain in your pelvic region. Um, and then last thing is asthma or any other respiratory disorder. There was an article that I was looking at the other day that sheds light about uh, the relationship and there's a correlation that we're seeing between pelvic floor dysfunction, respiratory disorders and low back pain. And they're talking about how if someone has dysfunction in one of these areas, they're more likely to have dysfunction in the other two areas. So it's a relationship that we're, that we're constantly seeing. So now we're gonna go into some myths and misconceptions that I hear quite a bit in the clinic. Um, people come in and tell me these things all the time. Uh, so I just thought it'd be fun to kind of go over these and uh, shed some light on each of these. So the first one being uh, that only women have pelvic floors. Um, and Pete's actually gonna hmm. be talking about this one, so. Yeah, so I've been a PT now for about 10 years and I remember going to one of my first professional conferences when I was a student and I went to a talk in the women, it was called the women's health uh, group. We have subgroups within our American Physical Therapy Association. Um, that was just 10 years ago that this whole area, even when we were talk, talking about pain in the pelvis, there, there was a designation within our profession of women's health therapists. And eventually they changed that name to pelvic health therapist, because how would you feel being a man with pelvic pain, having to go to a women's health therapist? So um, yeah, the acknowledgement that, that obviously both genders suffer from pelvic pain for various reasons. There's obvious various anatomical factors involved. Um, there's different surgeries that may be necessitated based on gender that can leave scar tissue and that can um, be a reason for pain. Um, men, women, we all deal with muscle guarding, muscle spasm, and the relationship that we'll talk about a bit more related to hip pain, back pain, and those sorts of things. But it's estimated that based on some of the research I've looked at, 10 to 15% of men suffer from chronic pelvic pain syndrome. And a syndrome is a box where we can't really put you anywhere else necessarily. It's to say you have pain and it could be due to a multitude of factors. So we hope to shed some light as we go through um, both with regards to women, both with regards to men, on some of these factors related to pelvic health, pelvic pain, and some practical things that you can do about it. So the next one is, it's normal to leak urine after giving birth as you age and with exercise. Um, one thing I tell all, probably almost all my patients is that uh, this is very common. Uh, extremely common, especially dear, like during pregnancy, after pregnancy, as you age and whatnot. Um, but it's not normal. So leakage happens during this these different uh, activities or time frames in your life um, because the pelvic floor muscles are unable to seal that opening um, or withstand pressure or anything like that. And so during pregnancy, for example, um, there's a lot of hormonal changes that occur and as you age. So things like that, that have an effect in terms of how your muscles can function, how well they can contract, how well they can relax, that motor control aspect of things. Um, pregnancy as well, I mean, your pelvic floor muscles, we talked about that support aspect and stability. And so um, you're having to carry around quite a bit of a load during pregnancy. And so um, that's, uh, that's one thing to keep in mind. It's a, it's, there's that. And then the aspect of childbirth and delivery that can be a traumatic experience for your pelvic floor muscles. Um, some women tear, um, it's prolonged labor, different things like that, that all play a role in 
what happens to those muscles afterwards. And then sometimes that can create a lack of an, an awareness of what those muscles are doing down there. Um, so, and that can also feed into as we age, um, we forget about them and maybe we're not using them the way that we should. Um, and then as we hit perimenopause and menopause, hormone levels are still changing, estrogen levels drop, which also play a role in our ability to uh, really utilize those muscles well. I want to say one thing here on a, a patient I had a couple of years ago that was, she had an eight-year-old child. And for the last eight years, she had been told um, that this was normal, essentially, that she was leaking when she would go on her morning walks. So she was having urinary incontinence. Um, and it, it wasn't like every foot strike, but if she struck her foot hard, she'd leak a little bit. So back to the postural piece, um, Kat wasn't here working with us at the time. Um, I've worked with other pelvic health practitioners and um, I, I, I didn't do anything related to direct pelvic treatment other than really impact and affect her postural alignment. Let's put it that way. So she was someone who held herself up very tall and in that she was not accessing the stability of her core. And as we enhanced her postural alignment, she got to a point, it took about two to three months where she could walk and she no longer leaked. And I got an email like six months down the road that she just got back from a trip to Europe with her family. She had been hiking and she was no longer having urinary incontinence. So the there's so many factors and for each person, it may be something a little bit different, but it's not normal. A lot of these things are normalized, um, but, but they don't have to be that way. No. Okay, so uh, Kegels will fix all your problems. Um, this uh, is not, it's not always just about the contraction, right? We, we don't always need to strengthen to fix whatever dysfunction that, or symptom that we might be having. Um, our ability to relax is just as important as our ability to contract. Really, I mean, any muscle, but especially through this area, um, a lot of times our pelvic pain patients I'm seeing tend to be a little bit more um, prone to holding tension in their pelvic floor muscles. So doing Kegels is just feeding into that dysfunction um, and could potentially cause further dysfunction down the road. So um, remember that relaxation is just as important. Um, and then the next one is uh, painful sex um, is normal when you first start being sexually active or after childbirth or again, as you age. Um, again, this, this, I think a lot of times we, we spend some time like talking with friends or family members or whatnot. And we start to hear like, oh, like, yes, this is, this is, you experience this too. Okay, I'm glad I'm not the only one. But this is, I think Pete put it really, really well in terms of it's, it's normalized um, because of conversations that we have, but that doesn't mean that it's normal. Um, and a lot of times going back to kind of what I was talking about with the Kegels, um, sex shouldn't be painful. Uh, this could be from trauma. This could be from restrictions mechanically uh, in terms of soft tissues tight. Uh, we hold tension, different things like that. There could be a, a, an emotional aspect. Um, there's lots of things that can play a role into this. Um, and this can, we'll talk more about this in future slides, but just talking, being aware in terms of like, sex being painful in different positions or uh, as you age potentially because of dryness and whatnot because of the hormone changes um, and things like that. Um, I should pee just in case before leaving the house. <laughs> um, this is a conversation that I've had with quite a few of my patients and family members um, about the importance of not just in case going. Uh, what, ha what we're doing essentially with this is we're sending these signals up to our brain that our bladders don't need to expand or stretch until at their like max capacity. So even if you don't necessarily need to go, if you don't have that urge, um, probably means your bladder's not full. So when we keep continuing to go 
um, we're not allowing that bladder to fully expand the way it should. And then what happens is that we're not allowing our, func our pelvic floor muscles to functionally strengthen as well. Because what happens is as that bladder fills, our pelvic floor muscles need to be able to be strong enough, right, to prevent leakage. And so that's a very functional way of working on um, our strength for those muscles. Um, the next one, so engaging your pelvic floor consciously during workout classes. And how do I know if I'm doing it correctly? Um, so this is one thing that we talk a lot about. We've already kind of shed some light about that in terms of we are big believers of not we want to automatically engage our core versus consciously be thinking about, okay, am I, I'm going to, I'm going to squat. I need to engage my, my core muscles. I need to squeeze my pelvic floor muscles and, and whatnot. That's, that's a lot of work. And uh, that's not the way that our muscles should function. Um, so again, tying into posture, body mechanics, getting uh, diaphragm over pelvis, um, and over pelvic floor so that everything can work well together in conjunction with one another and um, tying breathing into all of that during your workouts. Um, and then it's normal to strain during bowel movements. Um, this is something that I, I really enjoy talking about constipation. So um, <laughs> this is a fun topic for me. Um, some people have heard about the squatty potty, some haven't. Um, I, the science behind it is actually really good. So this, in this slide, it's comparing uh, your posture in sitting at like a 90 degree angle uh, with the orange person sitting there. Um, and then below it, it shows you what that actually looks like. So in terms of the rectum, this is a little 3D model of what the rectum looks like, but um, that, that red muscle that is slinging around the rectum in that picture is your puborectalis muscle. So that comes around uh, your rectum through there. And in that upright posture, it's basically this muscle is putting a kink around your rectum. So there's that angulation and that doesn't allow for an easy passageway of stool to come out. So when you bring your knees above your hips um, or your, you know, the idea is to decrease that angle. So whether that's you coming forward a little bit, resting your elbows on your knees, um, this angle might look like a lot. It does not have to be that high, even a matter of like lifting your heels up a little bit. So you're on your toes um, might be enough for you. But as you can see for your rectum, that allows for a much easier passageway for a stool to come through because what that does is as you decrease that angle um, of trunk and knees, then that relaxes your puborectalis muscle. And then from here, um, this, this is the Bristol stool chart. And so this talks about the different types of poop basically and what that looks like. Um, and it's a good guide to kind of, um, I think monitor yourself in terms of, do I need more water? Do I need more fiber in my diet? What that might mean for me. And so a lot of times with constipation, it could be one of the quickest and easiest things to look at is water intake. So more so with like type one, type two, you can see that's harder. Um, you might be straining. Um, something as simple as adding even, I, I tell people just add one eight ounce glass of water a week in addition to the normal amount of water. So that way you're going slow, it's doable. Um, and you're just gonna add in an extra eight ounces each week until you meet that kind of that, that place where you feel allows for you to have easier bowel movements. And then kind of coming down, you can see that type three or four is a little bit more normal. Um, and then it becomes a little bit more liquidy. And that's where fiber uh, is gonna be key in terms of getting that through diet um, and whatnot. All right, so we've talked a little bit about um, how posture is related to all this and that relationship between the diaphragm, the, the pelvic floor, and um, 
we're going to get into some of the pain dysfunctions and the urinary and bowel type dysfunctions Kat will talk to in a few minutes. Um, but we see most of our patients here because they have some kind of pain. Uh, we work with some patients simply because they're working on enhancing performance and they may not have pain, but most people find us for that reason. And when we're dealing with the pelvic floor, we're dealing with the entire pelvis. I'm going to borrow this. The, the pelvis is falling apart. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> there we go. Um, the pelvis is the energy transfer center of the body. It's like Grand Central Station, leg coming up, leg coming up. You've got your trunk and your arms. And, and essentially, the, the goal of an efficiently functioning pelvis from a neuromuscular standpoint and a biomechanical standpoint is to transfer force that's generated from the base, typically the legs, through the body and generate mobility and locomotion. Um, so when you consider that role and the, the pelvic floor muscles that are not only doing all those aspects of supporting the, the viscera and the organs, but many of these muscles come out to actually attach onto the hip. So pel a lot of pelvic floor muscles are also hip muscles. So if you have hip pain, there's a clear direct relationship if you have hip weakness, you likely have pelvic floor weakness as well. If you have core weakness, you likely have pelvic floor weakness as well. Um, there's a couple different ways of thinking about um, many people, many of you have heard of the SI joint, the sacroiliac joint that's between the center bone, the sacrum and each side of the pelvis, which is the ilium. Um, that sacral, the stability of this joint is based on two major things. One is the ability of that sacrum to really wedge between those two bones. And the other thing is the way that the muscles interact that cross. So you've got your glute muscles coming up the backside of the pelvis, which are interacting with your spine muscles and your opposite lat muscle through various fascial planes to just hold everything together. Um, so when we're looking at people that may be dealing with low back pain or SI joint pain, hip pain, um, really pain anywhere in this uh, lower trunk to upper leg, we've got to take into consideration the, the function and the effect that that pelvic floor has on, in that area. Another thing on here is athletic pubalgia. Um, many, many of you have heard of that, some of you may have not, but it's, it's another name for it is a sports hernia. There's actually many different designations and some disagreement in uh, what this actually is and how it presents, but it's a, it's a type of hernia of the, the back part of the abdominal wall and a, a major factor in that is weakness of the pelvic floor, tightness of the adductors, tightness of the um, external abdominal muscles, essentially a tightness of many of the muscles that are prime movers and a weakness of many of the muscles that are stabilizers. So I, we'll talk a little bit more about that as we get into some of the exercises at the end. Um, but the other thing on here is coccyx pain. And we could put coccyx pain or hip any, a lot of times coccyx pain is the result of trauma. Uh, a lot of time other pains in this area are the result of trauma. You might go to sit down and someone pulls the chair out from you and everyone laughs and no, you know, no big deal, maybe you're eight years old, but you know, over time, these, these things add up, the body remembers. Um, you may have a snowboard accident, a skiing accident, we're just falling apart here, um, but, Trauma can lead to all sorts of um, dysfunctions in, in anywhere in the body and the pelvic, the pelvic space is no different. Um, so Kat's gonna talk a little bit more now about some of the other dysfunctions that we see in this region. Okay, so um, we've talked a lot about in terms of pain and sexual dysfunction, pain with sex. I can talk a little bit more in terms of specifics that I had mentioned earlier. Um, position being one of them, I think that's one thing that I'll ask a lot of times, um, precursor to that, I'll ask patients, you know, are you typically having more pain with initial penetration or, um, is it with, you know, deeper thrusting, that kind of thing. And then asking further, is it dependent on position, you know? And so that can shed light in terms of which specific muscles and which areas, um, of the pelvic region might be potentially in spasm or holding tension or um, just lack of motor control to, to relax those muscles um, during intercourse. And so um, kind of things like that to, to make note of and to notice and communicating those things with your partner as well um, is super important. 
So um, things like using pillows for support during intercourse, whether that's, um, I think if you're feeling like, oh, I have more pain in maybe lying on my back, maybe putting a pillow underneath your pelvis or to support your legs or whatnot. Or maybe that for you looks like um, on all fours is more comfortable um, or using some sort of support um, while you're on all fours. Um, a lot of times uh, my female patients that will have pain during intercourse, um, trying female on top could be a good option as well. That way they can control kind of the depth in terms of um, uh, how, how deep and whatnot. Um, that a lot of times helps as well. And then in terms of if there's any dryness that people are experiencing, lubricant is gonna be key for that. Um, and so I think we've talked about in terms of like pelvic pain in general, rectal pain, vulvar pain, a lot of that is going to be, you know, if, if, if there's some sort of dysfunction with overactivity of the muscles, um, why is that over, why is that overactivity happening or is, and Pete talked a little bit about this too, but you know, like sacrum, like what's sacrum doing? How, how are your nominate bones moving as well? Um, if you're pretty stiff through here, chances are you're, you're not moving well pelvic floor wise. And that really does play a role. Um, so it's not just necessarily about, okay, we're, we're focusing solely on pelvic floor, especially with, um, pain and sexual dysfunction. It's, it's always super important to take a step back and also check to see, you know, how, what's hip mobility, like how's, how's your low back mobility, um, and everything related with the pelvis is super important um, in terms of uh, when people come in expressing pain um, with urinary and bowel dysfunction. Can I hop in real yeah. quick on that too? Just yeah. uh, something I wanted to mention as well on the male side is I've worked with a lot of patients over the years with testicular pain or pain mm -hmm. in the penis. And it's a lot of times like there may be something, there may be something locally going on anatomically um, there may be an itis like a, a, prost a prostatitis or an irritation and epididymis, something like that. Um, but there's nerves that come, you can see my, my spine model here with the nerves that come down and there's nerves that join and there's two nerves in particular, one called the ilioinguinal, which is from L1 and L2 and the um, genitofemoral nerves, which come down and actually innervate the, the genitals in males and females. And in the male, that can present a lot of times as testicular pain if, say, there is a, a disc herniation higher up in the lumbar spine, or even oftentimes if there's tension through the psoas muscle, which is a hip flexor muscle, which branches off of the lumbar spine. So again, as Kat was alluding to, it's not we're not just talking about pelvic floor. We're talking about the whole relationship of how these nerves are interacting from the lumbar spine down, where some of this pain can be coming from, um, it may be due locally, but it may also be coming from somewhere else. And that's part of the puzzle and that's part of figuring it out. Um, so in regards to urinary or fecal incontinence, uh, there's different types of incontinence. And we've talked a little bit about that in terms of stress incontinence with leakage during coughing, sneezing, um, anytime you're increasing that intra-abdominal pressure, you notice you leak. Um, urgency is where you get that sudden, almost uncontrollable urge or sensation that you have to rush to the bathroom. And a lot of times I'll hear people describe like, oh, they'll get home, they'll put their key in their door. And as soon as they put their key in their, their door, there's that sensation that they have to rush to the bathroom. Um, so a lot of that I see is oftentimes behavioral, we've created this pattern where we'll do something and we'll go to the bathroom immediately after. Um, and so the body becomes used to that. The brain registers that as this routine that it goes through to the point that it starts triggering your bladder <laughs> that you need to go. Um, so things like that is just changing up your, your routine. Uh, try going through a different door. Or um, sometimes if people notice like, oh, they drive by this particular mailbox or whatever it is, even putting like a, a hair tie or a rubber band around your wrist and providing some sort like snapping that along your wrist as you're walking by um, to send some sort of other stimulus to your brain to distract you from 
that signaling of, hey, you have to go to the bathroom now. Um, and then the frequency, um, that can be a variety of things in terms of um, underlying issues such as maybe overactive bladder, for example, and that can be um, whether it's dietary stimulants. So a lot of times we'll talk about bladder irritants, things like caffeine, alcohol, um, chocolate, citrus, spicy foods, all those all those kinds of things can be uh, irritating to the bladder, causing you to feel like you have to go more often. Um, so does this, uh, soft drinks are another big one in terms of uh, causing people to kind of have to rush to the bathroom. Um, constipation, we've talked quite a bit about. Uh, urinary retention, um, the inability to fully relax and fully void. Um, so working again on on different different tips to to work on that motor control um, of fully relaxing pelvic floor muscles, even working on different maneuvering techniques to to kind of work through to see if you can release more urine. And um, so some more dysfunctions. Um, I again I won't talk about all of these, but just some things to kind of hey maybe you didn't know that pelvic health PT can, can help with, with these things. Things like um, erectile dysfunction, Peyronie's disease, um, things like that. A lot of times, you know, working on improving blood flow, whether that's through, um, there's restrictions soft tissue wise, especially with Peyronie's disease um, and working using different uh, manual therapy techniques to, to improve scar tissue or um, blood flow or restrictions potentially at the hip or pelvis. Um, different things like that. Um, similar with erectile dysfunction and working on uh, ways to improve blood flow um, through soft tissue work, talking about diet. Another thing, you know, we, we, do, we do take a holistic view in terms of the way that we treat our patients and the way that we talk about uh, their symptoms. And that's something that we do uh, emphasize in terms of, we've talked a lot about posture, but also sleep. Um, diet, what kinds of foods they're they're eating, and um, inflammation is, is is key as well. Um, so all all those good things um, in terms of uterine and ovarian dysfunction, um, endometriosis, and infertility, and even dysmenorrhea, so painful menstrual cycles. A lot of those, um, if there is a restriction at the visceral level or organs. There, is, there are ways that we can work um, externally around the abdomen to work through restrictions that have occurred, whether that's through scar tissue buildup or previous trauma to the pelvis. And maybe um, all of our organs should be able to contract and relax the same way that muscles um, contract and relax. And if they're restricted for whatever reason, then that's that inhibits their ability to, to, to move um, throughout the pelvic region. And um, their, our body has a special way of letting us know uh, when things are not quite moving the way they should. Um, so those are things that I think I've seen a lot of people maybe not know that PT can help with that. But um, yeah, I've seen, I've seen it with a lot of patients. I've seen that with myself. Um, in terms of having uh, therapists work on me viscerally and improving um, the pain that I experience with menstrual cycles. So. so these are just some, again, this is not a, an, an every, like an all-inclusive. These are just some things that I thought about in terms of, hey, like when, when should I maybe see a pelvic health physical therapist? Um, so leakage is on, is on there, whether that's urinary or fecal. Um, and that can be, we talked about different, uh, different types of incontinence. We didn't touch a ton in terms of fecal incontinence, but this could be um, maybe someone had a vaginal delivery and had, uh, you know, a stage four tear. Um, and that went straight through rectum and whatnot. It was repaired, but maybe there's still leaking um, stool. Um, that's definitely something that, uh, PT can help with, 
um, in terms of working through scar tissue, working on your ability to, to kind of, again, become aware of that area and working through that motor control and coordination of those muscles. Um, anything with heaviness or pressure in the pelvis, uh, pain, we've talked a lot about constipation, um, burning sensations. Um, a lot of times I see can potentially be associated with either overactive bladder or um, pain in general with pelvic pain um, can be something from pelvic floor muscles being overactive and not being able to fully relax. Um, and then your typical kind of pregnancy postpartum, um, perimenopause and menopause is also another thing that's not on there, but that's an area that I think is not often talked is not often talked about. Um, and I think as, as women age, that's something that they don't know what to expect. As hormones are changing, they're, they're having all these wonderful symptoms of hot flashes and um, potentially vaginal dryness, um, mood swings, um, night sweats, all these different things. Um, and there are ways that, you know, because of those symptoms, because of the uh, decrease in estrogen that can cause um, other issues, pelvic floor wise and tissue um, around the vaginal area. Okay. So stop share here. Yeah. We're going to go through some, a series of different exercises that we encourage you all to um, perform with us in practice. We'll walk you through them. Um, but the first one, or first section that we'll do is breath work. Um, so working on um, diaphragmatic breathing and and so you can work on breathing through your diaphragm. A lot of times people, we emphasize this because of that relationship between diaphragm and pelvis, but a lot of times people will breathe through their chest. So they're not really using their diaphragm all that much. Um, so we emphasize um, that, that kind of focus, that conscious effort of breathing through belly. So if you're able to, um, get it onto your back with your knees bent here. And I often tell people to place their hands over their abdomen, just as a cue. Um, and you can go ahead and I typically have people um, breathe in through their nose. And as you inhale in, trying to expand through your belly versus your chest. And then exhale out through your nose. And notice where you feel the movement coming from. Do you feel that more in your chest or do you feel that in your belly area? And you can go ahead and keep, keep breathing through here, um, in through your nose, out through your nose, and working on that expansion in your belly. And then notice as you're inhaling in, can you feel that breath um, move down towards your pelvis? Um, and work on noticing if your pelvic floor muscles, what they're doing as you're breathing in. Um, through here. I typically do tell people to rest their tongue on the roof of their mouth if it's not already. So as we've talked about with the inhale, um, belly should expand pelvic. So diaphragm is, is dropping down towards the pelvis. Pelvic floor muscles should also be um, dropping a little bit down as well. Is the video on right now? Uh, we just got a comment saying we don't have video. I spotlighted something. Are you, are you guys seeing us okay? Yes. Okay, awesome. Cool, thank you, sorry. Okay, um, so that is diaphragmatic breathing. You can also work on this in various positions. Um, if this doesn't work well for you, you can work on this in sitting, um, working on this. We'll talk about this in, I think, one of the next slides, but talking through different stretches, um, like 
um, child's pose, happy baby's pose, different things like that to kind of keep facilitating that diaphragm, breathing in um, some hip opening stretches. Um, so we can probably go through that there. Yeah, I'll show a couple of these. Yeah. And I'll put it back on you. Okay. Okay, so um, happy babies or happy baby pose is one of the poses that um, I'll oftentimes give to someone in terms of working through stretching. Um, this, if people don't have the hip mobility for it, that's totally fine. I'll tell people to then just bring their knees or bring their knees out and then feet together and then coming in through here. If this is still pretty difficult, you can grab a towel, wrap that around your feet and use that to kind of gently pull forward and or just even kind of rest through there and have your arms holding that up. So working through there and then working on breathing. So working through stretching the inner thigh muscles, working on um, opening the hips and relaxing those pelvic floor muscles through here. And then the full happy baby's pose is feet up in the air, coming through here. And again, working through diaphragmatic breathing. Another one that people can do is child's pose. So coming through, um, knees together or knees apart. Uh, again, if you don't have that, uh, if you don't have the mobility for it, you can stack pillows through here. You can straddle knees um, around the pillows to support your chest so that you're not um, having to come all the way down. But this is a good way to, to work through this, um, coming through here and then coming through like this. And working on your breathing through here. And this is a really good way to work on your diaphragmatic breathing while also uh, having that emphasis on expanding that lower rib cage um, through kind of the, the posterior chain or your back as well. Um, next, just this one. Mm, yeah. Um, another one that I like to give to patients is a deep squat. Um, this is Again, this is uh, uh, requires some some hip mobility. So if you don't have if you don't have the hip mobility need for this, that's totally fine. Happy baby pose is perfectly fine for instead of doing this. But something like if you're able to get down into a deep squat through here, um, if you like to be in that prayer position through here, that works. Um, some people like to hold on to something to counterbalance um, if balance is an issue. But again, the idea is opening up through the hips, knees and feet kind of ankled out, um, and then gently applying um, a little bit of a push outwards. Um, and the key is you can work on breathing. Breathing is going to be super important in this position. Um, breathing through diaphragm, trying to expand through the belly and um, trying to work on allowing those pelvic floor muscles to relax and to, to imagine that those muscles spreading. Okay, um, so next we can talk about some core exercises that you can do. We talked a lot about how much core ties in with pelvic floor. So an, uh, kind of a baseline progression that I'll take people through is uh, something that we call push, cross, pull, push. So that's going to look like, I know I have some pictures in the slideshow, but here um, you'll be on your back again. And you're going to bring your knees up towards your chest. I typically tell people bring their knees up closer versus being at a 90 degree angle. So coming up through here, tailbone should feel like it's pointing up and almost lifted up off the, the floor or the table or whatever you're on. Um, toes pointing up towards the ceiling or towards your face. And you're going to use your own hands here. And what you're going to do, you're going to put your hands at your, at your thighs 
And the force is going to be attraction up parallel to your thigh muscles. So instead of pushing straight down like this, where you're going to get just straight hip flexors, you're going to, your force is going up towards the ceiling and it's an isometric contraction. So there should be no movement. So hands are gently tractioning up towards the ceiling here. And that should, you should feel like your core is starting to kick in through here. Again, if you're going straight down this way, that's where you're gonna get a little bit more of these hip flexors and maybe you feel your quads working here. So tractioning up here and see if you can hold that. Maybe starting out at 15 seconds. Um, if you feel like you can go longer, then work towards being able to hold this for up to a minute. So you can be here while you're doing this um, resting tongue on the roof of mouth. So that's the push. Then we have the cross. So same thing, same position. You're gonna take your hands and cross over. And then same thing, you're gonna traction up towards the ceiling through here and seeing if you can hold that. Again, maybe starting out at 15 seconds and then seeing if you can progress that to a longer hold time. And then coming through hands. Now the next one is hands going over on top, um, around below knees through here and feet don't have to be pointed up for this one. They can be pointed down. And this one, the traction force is it's like you're trying to roll your knees back towards your chest, but you're not going to let it. So you're going to be here. And this one will helps this little bit more multifidus. So that muscle in the back. Again, holding through here, working up towards a minute. And then the final step of this one is back to the push. So this one here again, tractioning up towards the ceiling. And working through there. So one thing in terms of talking about doing those core exercises in relation um, or in regards to, to individuals who have prolapse, for example, or severe incontinence, we want to be mindful of breathing pattern as well, um, especially with um, prolapse. Uh, we don't. We want to be careful of not increasing so much of that intra-abdominal pressure. So utilizing the breath, making sure you're not holding your breath while you're doing these exercises, especially any in, um, abdominal work. Um, but you know, being more mindful of that breathing pattern. And maybe it's not you're holding for an amount of time. Uh, maybe you're holding for maybe four slow breaths, four or five slow breaths and trying to work through there or even working through um, different abdominal exercises where we um, set you up in positions that aid in repositioning uh, the organ that's prolapsing, for example, um, so that we position and then strengthen around through there. All right. So I'll talk through just a few more things. Um, and we'll go through the bridge progression. One thing I want to make note of just following up on what Kat was demonstrating there is like coming into this position like being able to do this deep squat to allow the pelvic floor to relax and open. This is something that pregnant women are told if they can get down there and do a lot of these deep squats just to work on preparing the birth canal and keeping things open. Think about, I've lived in India for a year and a lot of times you show up in the restroom and you see this hole in the ground and how do people squat in third world country as well? They squat like on the squatty potty and a good position or illustration of whole body health, right? Like to be able to be in this position, how many of you can get into this position and be balanced here, whether it's hip mobility, knee mobility, or overall ankle flexibility, trunk balance. So something to work towards. Um, and like Kat said, you can kind of hold on to something and kind of squat back uh, and use that. Um, now, if we're gonna do squats as an exercise, you can, you can do this as, like a range of motion and this is a functional position if you're going to start loading i'll show you that in just a moment briefly uh, we're not usually going to come down to such a low level where the back starts to round and be loaded 
but for flexibility, this is very good. Um, a common exercise that we'll do oftentimes is just a bridge progression. A few key points I want to make here. First of all, this is an exercise about engaging the glutes to drive the hips forward. Okay, you could also do it in a position like this, where you're just engaging your glutes to drive the hips forward. It's the same thing. We're working on hip extension. A lot of times people compensate by arching their back, gripping their hamstrings, um, but we want to make sure that we're emphasizing on using that glute. So I'll have people arch and sag or kind of round and flatten their back a little bit to find a comfortable neutral position and then engage the feet down into the ground and drive their hips up towards the ceiling. All right, two-legged bridges where you're just using your glutes is a great place to start with the exaggeration being that glute hip extension. Now, if someone has a weak pelvic floor, do you mind tossing me the ball? One thing that you may add is a ball between the knees and you're gonna gently squeeze that ball. That's gonna activate your adductors, the inner line of your legs. And what we're working on here is through engaging that medial line, we wanna to try to get some muscle carryover, what we call irradiation to that pelvic floor while we do that bridge to add for some stability to that pelvis as the glutes drive the hips into extension. On the contrary, if someone's overacted in their pelvic floor, you might use something like a band around the knees to activate the opposite muscle group, driving the knees outward to relax the inside of the leg and the pelvic floor and work on your bridges here where you're engaging the lateral hips. Of course, these are good for other things like weak hips and, and uh, issues related to that as well. All right, so you can work through a bridge progression, making sure that you're feeling, and one of these may feel better or worse than the other as well to you. So you can play around with what feels better as well. The, the progression that I'd leave you with here is you should be able to bridge up and then maintain stability through one hip and unload the opposite leg without dropping or rotating the pelvis. And then you could progress that to a single leg bridge where you're otherwise doing the same thing, engaging the hip to drive into extension, all right? Somewhat related to pelvic floor, also related to just general lower body strength. And then the last thing, and we've gone through this in other lectures, is a functional squat progression, more related to how we're maintaining that canister. And what Kat's been emphasizing uh, throughout this whole exercise section is being able to really breathe effectively while you do these exercises. So the way that we train people to squat is kind of half squat, half deadlift, but we start with the arms on the legs so that the weight of the back is unloaded. Now you kind of arch and sag and find that position where the spine's vertical, rib cage is vertical over pelvis. And you should feel in this position that you can really engage a good diaphragmatic breath in the way that the abdomen now assisted by gravity can really descend towards the floor. So see if you can, if you're following along with me, rest your forearms on your legs so that the back's unloaded, arch and sag the spine, find a comfortable neutral position, take a deep breath in, and see if you're able to just let that stomach drop down into the space between your knees, all right? From here then, engage your feet down into the ground so that you're exaggerating the use of your legs to maintain that position. And you should be able to take the arms off the legs without the spine engaging. So if you, if you stay totally still, you did it right. If you push the legs down and then you kind of like lifted like this, okay, now you're gripping from your spine and you've thrown off that relationship of diaphragm to pelvis. So we want you to maintain that neutral position, engage the legs. And from there, it's just the thighs driving the knees back. And like we did with the bridge, the butt driving the hips forward as you go up and down in your squat. Now, most people should be able to do what I'm doing here for at least three to five minutes, maybe five to 10 minutes. You're doing it in a way where it's just body weight, you're distributing the force, and you can set a challenge for yourself as far as the endurance and the repetition to train good body mechanics. Again, you're not going lower than you can maintain spine neutral unless your goal is unloaded flexibility through that functional squat position that we were working on, okay? I'll go back. You want me to share that just as we conclude? Yeah. Sorry. 
Okay, so here I just we left you all with some research. Just these are some a couple different books that um, have been recommended or I've read um, that have been really helpful and really informative um, in terms of navigating. And they're all on different topics. So we have one about um, male pelvis um, and uh, talking about, I think, a lot of things that are not talked about in regards to male seeking um, help from the medical, I think, healthcare uh, profession in terms of a lot of things that uh, go hand in hand with the pelvic uh, dysfunction that they might experience. Um, different things about kind of uh, pain with sex, endometriosis, um, protocols for uh, uh, pelvic pain and, and whatnot. Um, just some things to look into for your, for your benefit. <laughs> and then um, feel free to contact us. Uh, my email address is on there, Pete's email address is on there as well. Um, and our clinic phone number and contact information. Um, if you have specific questions um, or would love to come in and, and uh, see us or whatnot um, for public health, physical therapy or PT in general. Are there any questions um, before we conclude? We appreciate you guys uh, being here and we'd love feedback, but we have a little bit of time if there's any questions before we conclude. So we'll follow the chat box. I know you guys are muted. So if you have one that requires a question, let us know and we can unmute you. All right. Thanks again for being here. Um, you guys have a great rest of the evening and we'll catch you soon.